Age only 13 and a half, I was still boxing, but now left entirely to my own devices by my parents. I was getting to know a lot of people that shoplifted on a daily basis. I was also getting to know more and more of the young Nidri Terror, or YNT, God, I remember them, uh, as they were better known. The YNT had started a generation or two before my time. Back then, each area of Edinburgh had a gang. The Inch were known as Cumbie, Leith were known as Young Leith Team, YLT, and TCR, TCR were the Soul Cross Rebels. Each gang had a sign that described you as a gang from a specific area of Edinburgh, and ours was to hold your hand up, face out with your fingers all closed and your pinky finger up. <laughs> that was to say that the guys were fighting with tiny dicks, obviously. <laughs> it was the 3rd of June, 1977, and we'd been uptown stealing when we bumped into a lot of guys to Nidri, dressed in Scotland football tops and kilts. We're off to Wembley, they were singing. Come on, we men, come with us, it's going to be mental. This was an adventure me and Philly could not resist. I'm not going to do your voice, by the way. There's no chance, I'll get that right. Uh, Philly phoned his sit Philly. I'll now know you as the 350 Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> Philly phoned his sister, asking her to go to my mum's and tell her that we're heading to Wembley for the football and not to worry, like you do. Having no train tickets, we climbed down a, a wall on Market Street that led onto the platform where the London trains were leaving. I remember those. In those days, the doors opened when the train was still in motion. Tons of Scotland fans were running and jumping into the carriages as the, the train started to pull away from the station. Police were catching some, but there were far too many to stop us all. I sprinted alongside the carriage door with Scotland fans all hanging out the windows. The door opened and I put out my hand. A guy I recognised from Nidri, Tam Daly, grabbed me and pulled me into the carriage. Philly was running like mad, but at the end of the station it was nearing. The guys inside were all shouting encouragement, Come on wee man, they roared, you're almost there, but the platform was about to end and he wasn't going to make it. And that is when Tam Daly held onto a handrail, leaned right out the train, caught hold of Philly, heaving him into the carriage by his collar as the platform disappeared under Philly's feet. We just need to get a confirmation, Philly, that that is entirely true. Look at that, that's beautiful. Eh? There you go. There's no fiction here, that's great. There was a big cheer inside our compartment. We had done it, we were heading to London. The train was so rammed, we stood chest to chest in one area. I was beside Philly, Tam Daly, and other older guys from Nidri. We're the finest team in Europe, and we're going to Wembley. How do you say it? Wembley. 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 <laughs> the whole train was buzzing with fans, singing and drinking. Train companies wouldn't get away with carriages being as packed as that these days. No, I think they would. I'll tell you, mate. I live in Kent, and it's, you can't even get on a train. <laughs> yes, nuts. It hasn't changed. It's got worse. I think the ticket collectors had given up on this particular train. Any inspector asking for tickets would be told where to go or found themselves ejected headfirst through the windows if they had been too persistent. The guys were out with the cans of tenants and hip flasks. Me and Philly hadn't started drinking by this time and were happy enough with juice and a packet of Tudor crisps. We didn't, we didn't have ten pounds between us, but we didn't care. We could always find ways of getting food if we had to. The all for a twist and artful dodger way. The fans were making the most of the journey, telling jokes, laughing and bevying. Our carriage was so full of positive energy. There was a feeling of invincibility about us. Our skin was tingling. All the carriages were the same. Folk were leaning out the windows to holler down to one another. It must have been a six or seven hour journey, but it went by so fast that it almost seemed too soon when we pulled into London's King's Cross station. I was worried the police would nab us all as we got off the train. But the station was so heaving with wild Scots, <laughs> wild, untamed, wild Scots, I think they just decided it was better we were all outside. They waved everyone through, not even asking to see tickets. It was like being part of an army, the Tartan army. I felt ten times bigger than I was. I thought maybe this was how it felt being part of a clan in the old days, heading out to battle with everyone you knew. Once outside the station, Tam Daly said, follow us, given the famous Tam Daly grin and wink and we all headed down the street to Trafalgar Square. Hundreds, maybe thousands of fans had collected in and around the square with many wading and splashing in the giant fountain. Tam asked, where you be guys sleeping tonight? And we said, we would sleep in the square and it'd be okay. No you won't, replied Tam. 
and pulled out a checkbook from his pocket. I've got it sorted, you're both with me, and this is going to pay for everything. I couldn't believe our luck. We followed Tam and the other Nidri boys to a guest house where Tam wrote a check for the rooms. We then went out and he got us a crack and scran in the kind of posh restaurant where smartly dressed, stiff-faced folk were drinking champagne. The Nidri boys were all down in foreign beer while we drank as we drank as much juice as we liked. Right, it's time to go and get tickets for the Morris game, Tam said with another wink. Tam got tickets for him and his pals by cashing some more checks. He promised he would also get us into the game one way or another. And then he took us into Soho. The place was full of Scotland supporters, all in their football and tartan wear, just like the Bay City Rollers. Just you two stay there, Tam said, as he and the other lads went into a strip club. We'll be back soon, so then he move. If we lose you, we'll never find you again. They all disappeared into the club while me and Philly waited, enjoying watching the hustle and bustle of the place with so many fans in such high spirits. Just then, a drunk Scot came out of the club on the other side of the street shouting, that hooker's got a willy, dirty bastard. <laughs> a fucking bird tips and a fucking willy. <laughs> That's London. <laughs> <laughs> You should quote that bit on the morning uh, chat shows. <laughs> the next morning was match day. We'd hardly slept with excitement. After a greasy breakfast in a rundown cafe across the road from King's Cross Station, a march to Wembley was on. Scottish fans again invaded the underground trains. When the train doors opened, there was a rush of bodies all trying to squeeze through the doors. We make our way through the thin tunnels which echoed with voices, laughter and song. I remember the roar from the fran fans was like a war cry lifting me out into the light and fresh air of the street. Something inside me seemed to be flying. Another big roar went up and seemed to propel us on a wave of hope and expectation of a win. Those were the days when Scotland had a decent football team. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up purely from the energy of the fans around me. We approached the colossal Wembley Stadium on a surge of confidence. I looked up at the tall iron gates and the excitement just grew and grew. The old metal turnstiles were causing a crush, but the fans were in good spirits and took it in their stride. People were singing Scotland the Brave. Tam was true to his word, and as we got to the ticket collector, the other Nidri boys caused a loud distraction by banging on the windows, hauling in and such, and while the operator was distracted, Tam first lifted me and then Philly over the turnstile. We were in. Through a young boy's eyes, it was all magic and mayhem. The number of fans pouring through the gates meant that we got carried along in a mass of bodies. Me and Philly got separated from Tam and the others. We could just about squeeze our heads through other supporters to see the game as the epic crowd of bodies swayed back and forth, constantly moving like a living thing. Every time the England team got the ball, the Scotland fans started whistling and cheering. Being a foot smaller than the heads and shoulders of the crowd, I'd been jumping up and down like a jackrabbit in an effort to see the game. Suddenly, two big hands came under my armpits, and a moment later I was hoisted onto the shoulders of a giant Highlander with a wild ginger beard and tartan bonnet with a feather in it. There you go, laddie, he said in his big deep voice, you'll see better now. I'm sure to him I was no heavier than a can of tenants lacquer. But now I was about a meter clear of any heads and sitting like a king on those big burly shoulders. Best seat in the house. A second or two later, a Scottish player crossed the ball into the penalty box and Gordon McQueen headed the ball in for Scotland. I'll never forget it. I remember it as well. There was a roar that shook the concrete and stands. I felt it go right through my chest. Suddenly everyone and everything around me was jumping up and down, hands, bonnets, scarves flying up as if there was an earthquake. Fans were hugging, dancing, screaming, laughing, and beer was spilling and frothing everywhere. I felt the adrenaline shoot up my neck. Philly got pushed forward in the mix, but I could still make out his head. I think I might have been crushed if the Highlander hadn't lifted me. It was manic, but I wasn't scared. The Scottish end of Wembley kept an intense buzz all the way through half-time with the bagpipes blaring. I recall thinking how huge the pitch looked. The Highlander kept me on his shoulders until the 59-minute mark, when Ke King Kenny Dalgleish scrambled the ball into the net to make it 2-0, the fans went nuts again, and the terrific noise went up through the stadium as if we were inside a cauldron. I think I am with this microphone as well. I put my hands over my ears because it was so loud, and just then the entire crowd surged forward, bodies bashed together, and I fell from the Highlander's shoulders. 
I bounced off someone's back and somehow, somehow landed on my feet. Go on, wee man, someone said, hugging me and picking me up as we all celebrated. Then I was dropped and crammed into the mix, bodies packed back to chest, chest to back, and shoulder to shoulder. We were all being carried to and fro as the crowd swished and swayed. England got a penalty just near the end of the game and scored. The last few minutes were tense. People said next to me were praying. Sorry. People next to me were praying and biting their nails. Oh, is that right? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Should I just shout? Oh, is it? Uh, people next to me were praying and biting their nails, but the final whistle came, and with it, another almighty roar that seemed to be the one that unleashed all the tension. I got carried within a rush of tartan army supporters streaming onto the pitch, all jumping with their hands raised, clapping and punching the air. The pipes started playing, people were dancing, and the voices all joined in with the tunes. I would never again feel the buzz and energy of that day or anything like it. Philly had managed to keep his eyes on me and was fighting his way through random supporters, all hugging and singing, drinking and laughing. And I saw him for a second as bodies flew past him in navy blue and tartan, and then he was gone, swallowed up by a horde of Scottish fans, carried inside a wave of navy blue. Luckily, we'd already planned to meet each other at a specific place if we got split up. Folk were taking souvenirs of the hallowed Wembley turf and climbing on the goalposts. The crossbars broke and I remember the, the red lion rampant flags being waved amid a sea of tartan and smiling faces. I smiled and took a moment to look all about me. St Andrew's crosses were flying everywhere. Bonnets were thrown and twirled high in the air in a swell of Scottish energy. It was like we had won a battle. Everyone was so happy and the rest is history. I met up with Philly at our pre-arranged rendezvous. Both of us had collected tartan hats, flags and scarves during the celebrations and we got back into the centre of London but could not find Tam or the other lads anywhere. <coughs> Sneaking back on the train home was a no-no. The place was even with police. Just then, a van pulled up and tooted its horn. <laughs> it could only happen to you, eh? Really? A bunch of supporters from Fife we'd met the night before asked us if we needed a lift home. Our luck was in again. Get in, we men, the driver said. One of them jumped out the front to open the back doors, and about five others clad in tartan and Scottish football jerseys sat in the back drinking cans. They all welcomed us and shared what food and soft drinks they had. The van was slow, but the guys were good fun. A couple of them fell asleep and snored all the way back. It was near a full day of driving with the many piss stops and meals, but we were just so happy to get a lift back home. As he dropped us off in Nidri, one of the guys gave me a can of tenants lager and said, keep this as a trophy, son, a wee memento. I got a very hard time from my mum, who'd been pulling her hair out with worry. More than a day passed before she got the message from Philly's sister, but I was fine with that. I had a smile on my face as wide as Nidri Mains Road. I placed the can of beer in pride of place next to my boxing trophies. What an adventure. <laughs>